God bless you and God keep you. This is Dr. Maurice Mickles coming to you from the Pastor Study of the Bread of Viewer Church. Like uh, wishing you a, a happy Tuesday afternoon. It is good to be alive. It is good to come together to study the word of the Lord together on this Tuesday night. God is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth. It endures to all generations. Just to catch you up, uh, we're still all in, even with the COVID-19 outbreak here in the city of Columbus, in the uh, state of Georgia, in this country, the United States. We're still all in. That means several things for our church. First of all, that means that we're inviting people to join us for worship via the church website. We're still worshiping and praising God. And we're inviting our friends and our loved ones to be a part of our worship experience via the church website. All services and Bible studies are being posted there at their regular scheduled times. Uh, it also means that we're involved. We're involved, number one, in our prayer conference calls. Uh, the men pray at 6 o'clock in the morning, Monday to Friday. Uh, the corporate church prays every day until the band lifts at 7 a.m. And the women pray every day at 7 p.m. Monday through Friday. Uh, I'm asking us to continue in prayer. Uh, I'm asking our men to kind of pick it up a little bit more. We've been slacking in our attendance to the morning prayer call. Asking a few more of us to make that sacrifice to join us at six o'clock uh, in the morning for prayer. The phone number for the prayer conference call is there on your screen. Uh, I want you to call in in the morning, uh, 6 a.m., 7 a.m., and tomorrow afternoon, 7 p.m., to be a part of our times of prayer. It also means that we're involved in the study of the word. We're also involved in Bible study. And you're doing that right now. You're participating with me and our usual Tuesday night Bible study as we go deeper into the sermon that was preached on Sunday morning. Also, uh, that means you're participating in our Golden Ages Bible study, which is 1030 on Wednesdays. We're utilizing that period of time uh, to study the Sunday school lesson together uh, for the rest of this month, this week and next week. It also means that we're investing in the kingdom of God through our tithes and our offerings. And during this temporary reprieve, uh, there are five ways that you can share in your gifts. Number one, you can go to greaterbeulah.church and you can go to the in, to the All In Invest page, our online giving page, and it will give you the option of giving online. Or you can go to your uh, app store, be it the Google Play Store, or the Apple App Store and download the Givelify app and uh, make Greater Beulah Baptist Church, 613 6th Avenue, Columbus, Georgia, your favorite place of worship and give from your phone. It gives you one touch uh, capability in your giving. It also allows for you to set up recurring payments right there in the mobile app. If you're not going to give online, if you're not going to use the mobile app, you can come by the church, uh, the mail slot on the front of the sanctuary, on the front of our church building. Uh, you can leave your offering there in the mail slot. The mailbox is locked, and it is in a locked room, so it's double locked. And uh, you can be sure that your gift is secure if you give through the mail slot. Also, on, uh, on Sunday between the hours of 10 a.m. and 12 noon, myself and our finance team will be here at the church receiving your gifts and praying with you. Uh, our finance team will be receiving your gifts. I'll be in the pastor's study uh, offering one-on-one -on -one prayer with those who so desire to come and pray with their pastor. And for a, a fifth way to give, you can call your deacon or one of our deacons and arrange for them to pick your gift up between now uh, and Sunday. We're continuing on with our Burden Bearing Sunday on this weekend, so we still want you to give your uh, your gift 
your pledge, our goal was $24,000. That was $1,000 for every pew in our sanctuary. And we still want to collect that on uh, the fifth Sunday. We still want to give towards our mortgage. We still want to put money in the bank. And we still uh, want to make some improvements to our sanctuary. So I need you to prove to us, uh, not just to me, but to yourself, that you're really all in with GB. And uh, by maintaining your all-in commitment, you're still inviting people to worship. You're still involved in prayer. You're still involved in Bible study. You're still investing in the kingdom of God through your tithes and offerings. Let me pray for you, and we'll get into the word for today. Father, in Jesus' name, we love you, and we praise you. We give you thanks for this time we get to share together in your word. Now, Lord, as we dig deep, into this lesson of, of your name, El Shaddai, we pray that you'll speak to our hearts, speak to our minds, speak to our understanding, that we might know that we've been in the presence of the Lord. The entrance of your word gives light, so speak to us now, according to your spirit, according to your power, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for it all, amen. This weekend, we preached a message from the book of Genesis, chapter number 17, verses 1 through 8, uh, and I'll read those verses to you, and we'll get into the lesson for the day. Genesis, chapter 17, verses 1 through 8. Now, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless. I will establish my covenant be between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. So Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you will be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings will come forth from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants after you. I will give to you and to your descendants after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession and I will be their God. And last week, we continued, this past Sunday, we continued our study on the names of God entitled Knowing God by Name. And so, uh, rather than, than reviewing uh, the, the, the first message of this, we'll get directly into what we want to study for today. I do, I do call to your remembrance Psalms 9 verse 10 which is the foundational verse for our study. It says, and those who know your name will put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Again, Psalms 9, 10, those who know your name will put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. I want to begin this discussion with the question, with the question, does it ever seem to you that God is just taking too long? I mean, it seems as if, yeah, we say God knows what he's doing, but it doesn't really feel like he knows what he's doing because it takes him so long to do it. That's kind of where we find this text because God has made a promise to Abraham, and we're going to go through the scriptures and see how God has made a promise to Abraham, and over the course of an extended period of time, it doesn't happen. God made a promise to Abraham, and we'll see it in scripture. It's going to tell us that God made a promise to Abraham when he was 75 years old. And it takes him from 75 to 100 years old for that promise to come to pass. We're going to walk through those scriptures today. 
25 years of a promise from God. And instead of things getting better over the course of that 25 years, things got worse. But God is faithful. The Bible says in, 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 uh, in, in I want to say 2 Timothy, that God is faithful even when we are faithless because he cannot deny himself. Matter of fact, I want to tell you that, Pastor. God is faithful. I want to tell you that passage. I'm in the pastor study today, so I'm with all of my books. God is faithful even when we are faithless. That is going to be That's right. It is 2 Timothy chapter, th chapter 2, verse 13. I want you to have that verse. It's 2 Timothy chapter number 2, verse 13. It reads, if we are faithless, God remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. And so I want us to remember and see as we study the life of Abraham today. That God is faithful to his word, even when it seems like it's taking him too long. Even when it seems like God does not know what he's doing, we can trust God to be faithful. So let's start at the beginning. Let's go to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12, and we... We, we studied on last week when we studied the life of Abram that, that God uh, calls Abram out of his father's house. We studied in the Golden Ages Bible study on last week uh, all the way up into Genesis chapter 11 how Terah, the father of Abraham, left Ur of Chaldeans and went to the place of Haran and there in Haran he died. And so we pick up in Genesis chapter 12 with Herod, with Terah being dead in Haran and God calling Abram, beginning at verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great. And so shall, and you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. Listen to this verse. It's verse 4. So Abram went forth as the Lord had spoken to him. Lot went with him. Here it is. Now Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Herod. He was 75 years old. And the Bible says in verse, verse number three, the Bible says, excuse me, in verse number seven, let's look down at verse number seven. The Lord appeared to Abram and said to your descendants, I will give this land. God promises Abram at 75 years old that he is going to have descendants and those descendants will possess the land of Canaan at 75 years old. He's going to have children that's going to possess the land of Canaan. Here's your problem. Look back up into Genesis chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11, verse 29 says, Abram and Nahor took wives for themselves. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah, and the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and Iscah. Here it is in verse 30. 
Sarah was barren and she had no children. Sarah was barren, had no children, but at 75, Sarah is 10 years younger than Abram, making her 65 years old. Abram 75, Sarah 65. They have no children, but the promises of God is that their descendants are going to possess the land. So we start off with a 75-year-old man, a 65-year-old woman, promised children, but they have no children. Turn with me now to chapter 15, Genesis 15. We're going to skip 13. We studied 14. Let's look into 15. Because Abram and Sarah and Sarai still have no children. But you get to Genesis 15, and after these things at verse 1, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, Do not fear, Abram. I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. Abram said in verse 2, O Lord God, what will you give me since I am childless? And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, since you have given no offspring to me, one born in my house is my heir. Abraham is doing in chapter 15 what most of us have been guilty of doing. God has made a promise to us. And it has taken him longer than we expected him uh, to bring it to pass. And so here we go trying to get logical, trying to come up with an explanation as to how God has done what he said he's done without God doing what he said he would do. God said to Abram and Sarai, I'm going to give you a child. Because you, in order for you to have descendants, you have to have a child. And Abram comes to God in chapter 15 and says, well, you haven't given me a baby. It's been years. And I still don't have a son. I still don't have a daughter. I have no children. So what must be your plan is that you're going to take one of the sons born in my house, young man by the name of Eliezer from Damascus, and you're going to make him my heir. And you're going to keep your promise to me through Eliezer. The truth of the matter is, if we listen to the tone of Abram's voice, it almost sounds as if Abram is being facetious with God. Listen to his comment to God again, verses 2 and 3. Abram said, oh Lord, God, what will you give me since I am childless? The heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, since you've given no offspring to me, one born in my house is my heir. Abram wanted to get logical with God. Abram wanted to give God a way out. Abram wanted to be able to explain why what God promised hadn't come to pass. But the Bible keeps on talking in verse 4. And tells us that God doesn't need our plan B. Listen to what the Bible says in verse 4. Then behold, the word of the Lord came to Abram saying, This man will not be your heir, but one who will come forth from your own body. He shall be your heir. And look at verse 5. And he took Abram outside and said, Now look toward the heavens. Count the stars if you're able to count them. And he said to Abram, So shall your descendants be. And Abram believed in the Lord, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. Listen. Listen, God built Abram's faith. It didn't look like it was going to happen, but God says, Abraham, Abram, I know it doesn't look like it's going to happen, but you got to believe. You got to have faith. You got to have confidence in me, even when it doesn't look like it's going to happen. And so what God does is God gives Abram something to trigger his faith. Look up into the sky, count the stars, and if you can count them, you'll know how great your seed will be. The Bible says it stirred up faith in Abram. 
And the Bible says that Abram believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. But now we have to fast forward to chapter number 16. Because chapter 12 says Abram was 75 years old when God originally called him. We've already had some years to pass when we got to, when we got to chapter number 15. Still no child. Now we get to chapter 16 and there's still no child. No child. And guess how long it's been? 11 years. God originally made the promise when he was 75. And the Bible tells us at the bottom of chapter 16, we're going to go back to the top of it, but for, for, for context sake, verse 16 of chapter 16 says that Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to him. It has been 11 years. And God still hasn't done what he said he was going to do. Oh, man. Talk about patience wearing thin. Talk about, talk about your hope running out. Talk, the, the book of Proverbs says something about a hope being deferred makes the heart sick. They waited and waited and waited and waited, and God still hasn't done what he said he would. So in chapter number 15, Abram gets logical. He tries to give an explanation for God. But in chapter 16, Sarai steps up and Sarai says, since God won't do it, we'll do it. Since God hasn't done it, we'll make it happen. That's some of us as well. That when God doesn't do what he promised he would do, we have a tendency of taking matters into our own hands. We have a tendency of trying to do it ourselves. We have a tendency of trying to make God's word come to pass on our own. Let's look at how that happened in Genesis chapter 16. Beginning at verse 1. Oh, this is going to be heavy. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. And I want to say, but Sarai had an Egyptian maid whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, Behold, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Please go in to my maid Perhaps I will obtain children through her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. The implication is that he agreed. Oh, ladies, listen at verse 3. <laughs> listen at verse 3. After Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, listen. Abram's wife, Sarai, took Hagar, the Egyptian, her maid, gave her to her husband, Abram, as his wife. Let that settle in on you. The Bible says that Sarai gave Hagar to Abraham as his wife. And the next verse says, Abram went into Hagar. He knew her in the biblical sense. And the Bible says that she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her sight. They took matters into their own hand. And they, they created a mess. That's what it means. It means that they created a mess. 
They, they stirred up confusion in the home. They separated from Lot because they wanted to keep peace in the home. And now, because it doesn't look like God is going to do what he said he's going to do, they open the door for confusion to come into the house. And guess what happens? You have Abram sleeping with the, with the handmaid that the wife has given him to be his wife. And now the handmaid is looking at Sarai funny, and Sarai is looking at the handmaid funny. And now we got confusion in the house. We got Abram in between two feuding women because they decided to take matters into their own hand. Have you ever been there? When you took something into your own hands, you said that you weren't going to wait on God to do what God said he would do, that you were going to make it happen on your own. What happened in the aftermath? Wasn't it a mess? <laughs> Wasn't it difficulty and confusion and drama? Because you decided to put your hand on Something that wasn't yours to handle. May this be a word of warning to us, and I'm going to move on. May this be a word of warning to us that we should keep our hands off of God's business. God said that he would handle this. God is responsible for bringing his promise to pass. It is not our job to make what God said would happen, happen. God is responsible. And when we take it on ourselves, we create unnecessary trouble. And the Bible says that when they had Ishmael, the Bible says in chapter 17, we won't get there today, but in chapter 17, down around verses 18 and 19, let's, let's start up at verse 15. Then God said to Abram, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and indeed I will give you a son by her. Then I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people will come from her. Then Abram fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, will a child be born to a man 100 years old? And will Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And here's the part. Abram said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. <laughs> God is telling him, this isn't my plan. And Abram is still asking God to work with what he did. He's asking God to work with what he did in his flesh, not with what God did through his spirit. And listen to what God says in verse 19. But God says, no. Not Ishmael, but Sarah, your wife, will bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. Ishmael is going to be blessed. That's the next verse. That's verse 20. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I will bless him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly, but he is not the covenant promised child of God. Ishmael, yes, I'm going to bless him because you asked me to bless him, but you cannot expect me to bless your mess. The Bible said that God's plan was always for Abram to have Isaac through Sarah. It wasn't Eliezer, the son born in his house. It wasn't Ishmael, that mixed boy, a Hebrew and Egyptian that was born to the maid. It was always Isaac. The problem is that between Ishmael and Isaac, between chapter 16, verse 16, chapter 17, verse 1, there's 13 years. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar brought Ishmael to him. Now, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, it's been 13 years and God was silent for 13 years. 
Oh Lord, it's so it's so sad. It is it's so hard to deal with when you got a promise from God. God said in, in when I was 75, 25 years ago, that he was going to give me a baby. 11 years passed and I made a mistake and I tried to make it happen on my own. And then 13 years passed and God won't talk to me. So now you got a 99-year-old Abel, an 89-year-old Sarah, still no baby. Now think about this here. If we were to go to Romans, if we were to go to Romans chapter 4, the Bible would say that both Sarah's body and Abram's body, Romans 4, 19, Sarah's body, Abram's body are both as good as dead. Think about it. 90 years old, Sarah is postmenopausal. Her ovaries have stopped producing eggs. <laughs> There's no more estrogen. There's no more progesterone. Her reproductive organs have started to shrink and to thin and atrophy. There is no possibility for a baby at 90 years old. Because of the slowing of his system, because of the slowing of Abram's system. Abram, the way, the way we can say it, Abram's soldiers ain't marching no more. Both bodies are as good as dead. And God hasn't talked for 13 years. So now the question we have to ask is, what do you do when God has promised you something and not only has it not come to pass, God has stopped talking? Listen. Abram didn't know it. Sarai didn't know it. But God was setting the stage to introduce them to a new aspect of his character. Remember what I taught you last week, that God often reveals himself in the crisis moments of life. That God will allow you to go through an experience that will test and try your faith so that he can introduce you to another dimension of himself, to a new reality of God that you never knew before. Eleven years of waiting plus 13 years of silence was all designed to set up a stage to provide a platform so that God could introduce himself to Abram and Sarai. And he does it in chapter 17, verse number one. It's been 13 years since God has talked to Abram. And the Bible says that the Lord shows up. And when the Lord shows up, the Lord has a, a new title to present to Abram. Is verse 1. The Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. He says, I am, here's your name, El Shaddai. My name is El Shaddai. Which means that God is all-powerful and that God is all-sufficient and that he is able to do whatever it takes to meet your need. God is able to do whatever it takes to meet your need. Let me say it another way. 
God allowed Abram's situation to get as bad as it could get so that at just the right time, he could step in and prove to Abram, I have the power to work things out in your life and I don't need your help. Say it again, Pastor. I said that God allowed your situation to get as bad as it could get. So at just the right time, he could step in and prove to you that he has the power to fix your situation and he doesn't need your help to do it. He's God all by himself. 25 years of delay, 13 years of silence was all a part of God's plan to introduce Abraham to El Shaddai. But God that can do anything. <laughs> oh, it's so wonderful. God can do anything. He say to Abram, he'll say to Jeremiah, there's nothing too hard for me. And he let your situation get as bad as it could get. Because he wanted to show you and prove to you that he's El Shaddai. Now let me, let, let me, let me teach you a few things about El Shaddai and, uh, and we'll wrap this up. The root word for the title of God, El Shaddai, is the word Shad. S-H-A-D, Shad. And it doesn't have a definition per se, it's rather defined by word pictures. And if we look at these word pictures, they'll help us get a closer understanding of who El Shaddai really is. Number one, the first word picture for, for that root word Shad and El Shaddai is that of a mother's breast. This isn't just a woman's breast. This is a mother's breast. Now, uh, When a woman gets pregnant with a baby, one of, the, one of the things that happens to her body is that her breasts begin to produce milk. This is for the baby's nourishment. Truth of the matter is, everything that baby needs to grow is already in the mother's milk. Say it again, Pastor. Everything that baby needs to grow up has been put in the mother's milk already. There are some antibodies in mother's milk. That's going to help that baby fight off viruses and, and, and bacteria. Already in the milk. There are some vitamins in that milk. Some proteins in that milk. Some fat in that milk. That the baby is going to need to grow strong bones and muscles. And it's already in the mother's milk. The baby's not even a year old yet, so he cannot chew meat. But all of the nutrients that baby needs to develop is in the milk. And that's God's word for somebody today watching me. That God can sustain you until you're ready for your next level. I don't know what your next level is, but I do know that between where you are and where God wants you to be, he knows how to sustain you until he gets you where he wants you to be. First Peter says it this way, like newborn babes 
crave is the Greek word there. In your English translation, it says desire. But in the original language, it says like the newborn babe craves his mother's milk. We should crave the word of the Lord. God knows how to give you what you need to sustain you. We just finished studying the book of Joshua. And in the book of Joshua, we made note of the fact that for 40 years in the wilderness, God gave them manna and God gave them quail and God gave them water. For 40 years, we made mention of the fact that for 40 years, their clothes didn't wear out. Their shoes didn't get too small. God sustained them while they were going through the development process to their next level. And see, this is important. Why? Because God was developing Abram over the 25 years. Abram was learning to trust God. Abram was learning to have faith. Abram was being developed over those 25 years. Even in the silence of God, Abram was being matured through the things he was going through. And the truth of the matter is, Abram had been a lot of places. Abram had made a lot of mistakes. But no matter where he was or what he was going through, God sustained him through the delay because he's El Shaddai. It doesn't matter where you go in life. It doesn't matter what you go through in life. It doesn't matter what you're faced with in life. It doesn't matter what you do wrong in life. We serve a God that sustains. Every morning on the prayer call, I ask God to preserve your life, to sustain you on your journey. He is able to do just that. He is able to sustain you as you make transition from where you used to be to where you should be. El Shaddai, the God of process, says that I was God when I called you from your father's house in chapter 12 when you were 17 when you were 75 years old. And I was God when you tried to make an ex make a, make an explanation for me when I didn't require it and you said that Eliezer was going to be your heir. And I was God in chapter number 15 when you were 86 years old and you tried and you went into Hagar and you had Ishmael and I'm God now when you're 99 years old and your body is dead. And your wife's womb is dead. And I kept you the entire time. I think we ought to take a praise break right here in the middle of this Bible study lesson. And thank God. Because he has kept us. All along our journey. If we were in the old church, we say all of our lives. God has been good to us. Then the next verse says, down through the years, God's been good. We need to thank him because he's a God of process. That even if he's not talking, he's still working. That I'm not lacking. I didn't miss out on any meals. That my enemies didn't overtake me. That, I, that, 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 uh, that my life was preserved. You know why I thank God? I thank God that he kept me in spite of my mistake. Even though I had to deal with the consequences of my decisions, God still kept me. Even when I had to live with the ramifications of what I did, I had to reap what I sold. But he kept me. He sustained me. He preserved me. That's why every time we're together, I end our time with that erotic blessing. The Lord bless you and the Lord 
keep you because I need him to keep me. I don't know about you. I need him to keep me in spite of my mistake because there's some stuff I've done and I did it intentionally. I did it on purpose and God has preserved me in spite of me. Hallelujah. This word is to show us. El Shaddai, the God of process, is to show us that God won't leave us or forsake us even when we have to live with the consequences of our own decisions. First of all, El Shaddai, the root word Shad, has the word picture of a woman's breast, a mother's breast, not just a woman, but a mother's breast, because it says that God sustains us. He gives us what we need to grow up. But there's a second word picture. I, I, have, to, I have to bring this in. The second word picture was of a mountain. Uh, you have some writers who believe, who suggest they're trying to tie the two pictures together. And so they call the mountains the breasts of the earth. But the idea is that mountains indicate strength. So when we're in the culture of the biblical writer, uh, a person is seeking refuge, he's seeking asylum, and so he'd run for the mountains. The way we say it is he'd run for the hills. And when he'd get into the hills, he'd find there a stronghold or a fortress, a place of safety, a place of defense in the mountains. Uh, another way to say this, he, he, they, they say that the mountain fortresses will soon become symbolic of the nation's power. And so when you saw the stronghold, you knew what kind of, uh, of nation you were coming to war against. The problem is, doesn't matter how strong man's stronghold is, it's always subject to defeat. It's always subject to be broken. But thank God for Jesus. The Bible says the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run therein, and there they'll say. His power can never be broken. The way we say it around here, because God is the greatest power, we shall never be defeated. Matter of fact, you ought to say that with me right there in your home. Because God is the greatest power, we will never be defeated. It is a picture of the strength of God. Last week, all last week, we did Psalms 91. This week, we're doing Psalms 46. Last, last week, we did Psalm 91. And both the names that we studied of God have all, have showed up in Psalms 91 and 1. 91 and 1 says, He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High, that's El El Yon shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. That's El Shaddai. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God, and him will I trust. We're doing Psalms 46 now. God is our refuge and our strength. He's a very present help in times of trouble. What does this have to do with El Shaddai? Listen to me. God wants you to know that what's too hard for you is just right for him. Let me say it the way my old pastor, Reverend Joseph Abba, uh, Inslee Baptist Church in, in Pensacola, Florida, used to say it this way. Man's extremity is God's opportunity. That when you run out, that's when God is stepping in. That there is absolutely nothing too hard for him. When you can't win your battle, when you can't win your battle down in the valley, you can run up into the mountain and you can find victory in the mountain because God can handle what you cannot. In fact, I believe that's why God 
allowed for 25 years to pass before he brought his promise to pass. See, see, I believe, I, I, I just have this, this unction that God did not want Abraham to get beside himself and think that he had anything to do with it. I think God didn't want Sarah to have anything to say about this. No one else could get any glory from this <coughs> but God. No one could take the credit for this but God. God waited until the fire in Abraham and the desire in Sarah had died out before he stepped in and said, now it's time. Is that where you are in your life? Has God been waiting on you to come to the end of yourself has God been waiting on you to stop trying to come up with your own ideas, to, talk, to stop trying to figure it out on your own, to stop trying to figure out how you can make this happen, tr stop trying to figure out how you can maneuver this around and come to the realization that without him, I could do nothing. But with him, I can do all things. That without him, all things are impossible, but with him, nothing, nothing is impossible. Could that be why God let you come to the end of yourself? Why God let your situation to get as bad as it has gotten? Because he wants to prove to you that when you can't do it, I can. When I'm preaching about uh, Peter walking on the water or the disciples caught in the storm, I often say that what was over their heads was under his feet. <laughs> Could that be what God is trying to do in your life, trying to show you that he is greater than your greatest problem? That he is greater than your greatest opposition. I heard that. That he is greater than coronavirus. That he's greater than diabetes and hypertension. That he's greater than a low credit score. That he's greater than that low GPA. That he's greater than a divorce lawyer. He is trying to show you that he's greater than all. There's one more thing I want to show you. El Shaddai is the God of process. He's the God of power. The last thing I want to show you, Lord, I'm almost out of time. The last thing I want to show you, he is the God of promise. Now we finally get to talk about Genesis chapter 17. It took 25 years to get here. 13 of those years, God did not speak again. Genesis 16 and 16 and Genesis 17 and 1 has a period of 13 years with God saying nothing. But when God does speak, hallelujah. Listen to what he says in verse 1. Oh, I might as well read verse 1 to 8. It's the whole thing. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. Abram fell on his face. God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you will be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, 
but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings will come forth from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you throughout their generation for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants after you. I will give to you and to your descendants after you the land of your sojournings, all of the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Listen to this. In your mind, imagine what it felt like to not talk with God for 13 years. Imagine what it felt like to have a promise from God and not hear from him for 18, for 13 years, excuse me. And interestingly enough, First thing God says to Abram after 13 years of silence is that I have not forgotten what I said I was going to do. I'm still going to do what I said I was going to do. He said to, said to Abram in Genesis 12, 2 and 3, he said, listen, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make your name great. I'm, I'm going to make you a blessing. He says, I'm going to bless those who bless you. I am going to curse those who curse you. And in you, every family on the earth is going to be blessed. And I ain't forgot about it, even though you felt like I did. God has not forgotten him. He's out there in the middle of nowhere. Yes, he stopped talking for 13 years. But even while he wasn't talking, he was working. And Abram and Sarai, even though they had taken matters into their own hands, stepped out of the will of God, and even though God allowed them to live with the consequences of their decision for 13 years, even when God was silent, his silence did not mean his absence. And at just the right time, God shows up and says, I'm going to make good on my promise. I know it don't look like it. I know it don't feel like it, but I'm El Shaddai. I'm the God who keeps his word. I'm the God of promise. But I'm not slow concerning my promise. Like you count slowness. But I'm patient towards you. God says, I, I knew what I promised you when I promised it to you 25 years ago. I knew it was going to take this long, but I haven't forgotten. And even when you're faithless, what we read in, in, in Timothy 2 and 13, even when you're faithless, I got to be faithful because I can't deny myself. Let me close. Let me close this lesson by, by asking you to pay attention to the text. This is Bible study, so let's dig a little deeper. I gotta stop here now. I'm, I'm about out of time, but let me dig a little deeper. This this is why you came to Bible study. In eight verses, God's going to say, "I will," seven times. Listen to it. Verse 2, I'll establish my covenant between me and you, one. I will multiply you exceedingly, two. Look down at verse number 6. I will, excuse me, yes, verse number 6. I will make you exceeding fruitful. I will make nations of you and kings will come forth from you. That's one, two, three, four. Now five. In verse seven, I will establish my covenant between me and you 
and your descendants after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants after you. Then come on down to number six. I will give you in verse, number six is in verse eight. I will give to you and to your descendants after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. And number seven, I will be their God. What is God trying to communicate? God is saying, thank you, Jesus, that while you were trying to do it on your own, I always had in mind that I was going to do it. That yes, you tried to make explanations for me. Yes, you stepped in, tried to take matters into your own hand, but from the very beginning, it was never my intention for you to do it. My intentions was to do it through you. God has something wonderful for you, but he wants to do it through you. Not you do it. He does it. He wants to do it. You have to let him keep his side of the bar. But at the same time, you got to keep your side of the bar. Verse 1, walk before me and be blameless. There's one more thing I want to say to you, and I'm stopping now. I'm past my time. God wanted Abram to remember. Didn't want him to forget. So guess what God does? So that Abram won't forget the promise of God. God changes Abram's name and Sarah's name so that every time they hear their name called, they're reminded of their promise. Abram, exalted father, becomes Abraham, father of a multitude of nations. Sarai, the, the princess, becomes Sarah, the mother of nations. Every time they hear their name called, they're reminded of what God promised them. I want you to know that God revealed himself to Abram and to Sarai so that he could show them that he was El Shaddai and he's doing the same thing in your life. So whatever God's promise is to you, I want you to make a practice of using it to define yourself so that you'll always remember what God has promised you. I am healed. I'm the blessed of the Lord. Start reminding yourself. I encourage you during this during this time of of, of, uh, of of being in our homes, not being able to congregate out in public. Take some time and, and remind yourself. I am blessed. I am cursed. I'm the head. I'm not the tail. I'm above only. I'm never believed. I'm rich, I'm not poor. I'm the lender and not the borrower. I'm healed of the Lord. Remind yourself that I'm going to live and not die because I got something to say. I will declare the works of the Lord. I ain't going to do it in the grave. I'm going to do it in the land of the living. I want you to be reminded today that it doesn't matter how long it has been, God is still going to make good on his word. We started with it, we end with it. Even when we're faithless, God is faithful because he cannot deny himself. Listen, I want to hear your questions. I want to hear your comments. So in the comments below, in the comment section below, if you have a question, if you have a comment, I want you to leave uh Leave your question or comment in the comment section below. Uh, I, I want us to remember 
uh, tomorrow morning at 1030. We will be uh, broadcasting our Golden Ages Bible study. We'll be studying the Sunday school lesson from this past Sunday from the book of Micah chapter number 3 and Micah chapter number 6. Uh, we'll have our music minister is going to meet on Thursday uh, by invitation only. Uh, those who are to be in the sanctuary of the Bread of Beulah Church on Thursday have already been contacted and they know who they are. Listen, I need you uh, to be consistent on our prayer call. Please, ma'am, please, sir, especially, sir, uh, we need you to call in uh, in the mornings, 6 a.m., 7 a.m., 7 p.m. Uh, the number uh, will be provided uh, there on the screen. We want you to make sure you call in to be a part of our prayer conference call. Uh, also, we need you to be consistent in your giving. Five ways to give. You can go to the website, greaterbeulah.church. Go to the All In Invest page. It will lead you to the Givelify online giving site so that you can give online. Or number two, you can download uh, the Givelify giving app from your place, from, from uh, your app store of choice. Uh, go to Greater Beulah Baptist Church, search Greater Beulah Baptist Church, 613 6th Avenue here in Columbus, Georgia. And uh, it will provide you one tap access for your giving. Uh, if you're not comfortable with digital giving, you can come by the church at any time, put your offering uh through the mail slot on the front of our, of our uh, facility. It will be placed in a secure box that's in a secured room uh, so that your gift will be secure until our finance team uh, comes in to collect it. You can also contact one of our deacons for one-on-one -on -one, uh, arrangement so that you can drop off your gift to one of our deacons uh, at the appropriate time. And then finally, on this coming Sunday, I'll be in the pastor's study. Our finance team will be in the finance office. I'll be spending time praying with the saints one-on-one -on -one between the hours of 10 a.m. and 12 noon. And our finance team will be receiving your gifts, your tithes, your offerings, your burning-bearing commitments. Again, our goal for, for burning-bearing Sunday is $24,000, $1,000 for 24 pews. We want to put some more money towards our mortgage. We want to put some money in savings. And we want to make some repairs to our sanctuary. So we need you to be consistent in giving back on this week. Listen, I'm praying for you. Uh, I love you so much. Uh, it is my joy to be your pastor. And so I, I, want you to, uh, I, I, I want you to know that. I want you to know that I love you so much. My wife and I are praying for you. We want you to continue to visit the website, greaterbeulah.church. All of the pertinent information will be there on the website. Please, ma'am, please, sir, spread the word that we're still having church online. And uh, that will be Sunday at 10 a.m. via the greaterbeulah.church website. Listen, let me pray for you and bless you. Lord, we thank you for what our eyes have seen, our ears have heard, our hearts have felt. And now as this time of sharing has come to its end, we thank you for what our eyes have seen, our ears have heard, our hearts have felt. Now, Lord, we pray that you be with us and stand by us. Lord, wherever we are, wherever we're going through, Lord, you know, so we commit ourselves to you. We pray, Lord, that you bind all accidents and incidents that stand between us and our way. When we arrive at whatever place we're headed, that you allow us to arrive there in divine order, finding all things in divine order. Lord, we're asking you to dispatch your angels to guard and protect us. Cover us in your blood, shit over, lose power, Holy Spirit, rest, reign, and rule in our lives. Lord, this is your church. We're spread across our community. So, Lord, we want you to have your way with us. Send us a revival, fresh wind of the Spirit, fresh fire of the anointing. May it be manifest in 613 6th Avenue. In Jesus' name, we love you so much. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord give you his grace. The Lord turn his face toward you. The Lord give you his peace. In Jesus' name, amen. I love you. God bless. Peace.